Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Today we're, go we're going to do our first AGL live session, and the topic is to discuss Agile and Government 101. Um, I'd like to invite our, our viewers to use the Q&A icon to ask our panelists questions. Um, you're going to see that in the bottom right corner of the viewing window. Um, we're going to start with introductions. So I'm Elizabeth Raley. I'm Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master and also on the steering committee of AGL. Today we have Rob and Chris from ATNF. We have Laura from GSA and we have Luke from GovFresh. And let's start with some brief introductions. Chris, do you want to go first? Sure. My name is Chris Cairns. I'm the director of ATNF Consulting within ATNF, and ATNF is within uh, GSA, and ATNF is a, a digital services uh, agency that provides uh, services to um, other agencies within the federal government. Hi, I'm I'm Laura Stanton, and I am the acting director of the Common Acquisition Platform. The Common Act was so rather than being a practitioner of Agile, I am a program manager who uses Agile to build the tools and to build the Common Acquisition Platform, which is um, designed to consolidate acquisition information from across government. Let's go to Rob. Uh, so I'm Robert Reed. I'm Chris's partner in 18F Consulting. Um, Chris and I entered government a while ago as Presidential Innovation Fellows. I view myself as an Agile coach. In the past, I've mostly been a developer or a manager of developers. Um, Laura, Chris, and I are all federal employees, but we'd like to welcome uh, any members of the audience who are from cities or states. We would like AGL to be kind of a bridge between uh, federal government and other forms of government. Uh, and so I'm mostly a champion for Agile technologies. Great. And Stone, welcome. Let's go to you. We're doing brief introductions. Hi, um, I'm Stone Tran. I'm a, the Scrum Master in the Office of Digital Design Innovation. This is in the Broadcasting Board of Governors. It's the agency that runs the U.S. government's international media, such as Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia. And um, I just want to say, I was in a hangout with a bunch of other people. I don't know if they know about this link. There may, yeah, there may have been a mix-up there. So um, let's keep going. I will make sure that um, we spread the word about the other link. Okay. Okay. And we'll go to Luke. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Luke Fretwell, and I have a government technology blog called GovFresh. I also advise uh, several companies, government technology-focused companies. Um, and about a year ago, I started working with Civic Actions on researching agile government um, and how government was deploying agile. And we came to this conclusion that a lot of there were people using it, um, but there was sort of an agile divide. And we really wanted to figure out how to bridge that divide. And the first um, component of that was to create a network or a community which led to the formation of Agile Government Leadership. And then we built a steering committee that includes um, a few folks on this panel, but people who are um, local, federal, and um, public-private sector Agile practitioners. Um, and then we started building resources, and we're going to continue to build out those resources, um, the first one being the Agile Government Handbook, which can be found at handbook agilegovleaders.org. Um, and, and I'll kick off. Uh, I, this is, you know, for, for all of you, um, I guess, you know, for the people, for those who don't understand what Agile is, you guys want to sort of give your uh, elevator pitch on what Agile is? And we'll just go from left to right, starting with Chris. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I, so this is going to kind of sound like a cop-out answer, but um, I think there's no better definition than that than what you would find in the Agile Manifesto. So you can certainly type that in Google and then read through that. Um, you know, no matter what the form of Agile you're using, um, I think as long as you you can stay true to those those principles um, and values, that you'll you'll be successful in your your Agile endeavors. I think the way I always like to try to um, describe Agile is to kind of is to contrast it to waterfall. And uh, for those folks who are kind of familiar with the waterfall systems development methodology. Um, you know, it kind of makes two big assumptions. You know, one that you know um, all requirements can be known up front, and then people don't change their minds. And 
um, when you're dealing, you know, in areas where there may be unknown problems and unknown solutions, you know, that approach leads to a lot of failure. So, I mean, Agile really takes kind of a different stance and and really sort of um, accepts um, changing requirements um, through kind of like an evolutionary, iterative, and incremental nature. So, the, so Chris, I, I really can't build much more on Chris's definition of it. From the standpoint of what I use it for is as a, as a program manager who's relying on agile methodologies is it's an opportunity to say that okay we have functionality delivered on a bi-weekly basis I can shift the priorities I can tell it's harder to tell people what they're going to get in six months or twelve months from that standpoint for people who are used to waterfall but on the other hand I have a lot more confidence in the capabilities of the team to be able to consistently deliver um, than I would ha than I would have had in this in this position in a waterfall environment. Rob, well, um, I'm tempted not to follow uh, Laura because that's you know when at least a federal employee says they have more control and are more confident in what they're going to get. That's pretty much the end of the game, right? Uh, if we could <laughs> if we could quit having government waste money by doing things that don't work, we would save the taxpayers so much money that I think there's no stronger recommendation. But uh, let me just read the Agile Manifesto, which Chris mentioned, which uh, we could, I've been able to pull up here. Uh, it is to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, value working software over comprehensive documentation, value customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Okay. Stone, do you want to add to this? Yeah, I just want to um, uh, sort of resonate the, the, the two values of collaboration, uh, both within the team, that's really important in working in Agile, but also collaboration with your customers and also other stakeholders. Um, I think that's a very different approach. Um, you know, it's not like you're going to see somebody now and then six months later you'll see them again. It's, it's the, the feedback loop is a lot shorter, which I and my team really like, um, especially when you're doing working on the delivery side of making something and when it comes to making something, you know, we're producing things that are closer to the expectations of what the users want and as someone who works in technology, you know, I love seeing people using the stuff that we make and um, when it's more in line to what their expectations are there are fewer surprises, and and I, I also think that like you know everyone talks about oh agile you know are we doing it right and there's really no despite what everyone some people might say there's no right way as long as you you're doing it right so um, you know certain practices aren't working for you then skip it uh, find things that work for you and it's the adaptability that is a, a big tenant to agile that I as a scrum master really embrace. Mm -hmm. And we covered some of this, I think, but why is it so important for government to be using Agile? Chris, do you want to start? Well, why is it important? Well, geez, we, you know, at least on a federal level, you have a history of a lot of mega hundred million dollar failures that, you know, uh, followed this, you know, waterfall approach. So um, I think Agile has very clearly proven itself over the decades to be a superior type of approach for, for certain types of projects. Um, and um, I, th I think just in that alone, I think it's very important for government um, to look to adopt it and get good at it and make more efficient use of taxpayers' dollars because um, when you don't make good use of taxpayers' dollars, you know, it, it's, it, that's money that's not going toward really, like, important type of mission activities like, you know, um, anti-human trafficking and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. I would I would back up Chris once again, which is that you have the government has a legal it has a moral obligation to be able to use the dollars that we receive in taxes the best way possible, and the better that we can deliver, the more confidence that we can install, and the more that we can respond to the users and show that we're building what's what's important versus what we're guessing is important, really is critical to, to having that confidence level and you have to have the confidence level of other agencies and of the citizens to be able to effectively work. Mm -hmm. Rob, do you have anything to add?
Yeah, I, well, I would have a question for Laura, since she has been practicing this and is, is um, a, a consumer of Agile processes. Uh, so can you give us an example of, in the work that you've been doing, where you've discovered something through early customer collaboration by going back to the users and made a change that was surprising to you that you might not have discovered if you had been using a, a waterfall and requirements document based approach? Um, I can give you a great example. So about 18 months ago, I was looking at revamping our e-commerce system in GSA. Um, we had, there had been a number of user complaints about GSA Advantage, um, which is the online buying system that GSA runs for, um, for its contracts. And so we, w we started the project with the assumption that we needed to revamp the entire GSA Advantage system. Through the user interviews, which was more human-centered design, but the same concepts as Agile, we ended up discovering that the real issue was that agencies who were trying to buy things and individuals who were trying to buy didn't know what was available in to even buy off of. They didn't know what contracts were out there. They didn't have the pricing data. They didn't know how to, there was no consolidated sort of center of information around acquisition or even around trying to fulfill mission needs. It would be like going to five grocery stores, checking the price in each one, and then trying to go back to the first one because that's where you, that happened to be the best place. But you didn't know that because nothing was comparable. So instead of revamping the advantage system, we redirected the entire project and ultimately it's become the acquisition gateway which is consolidating all the information. If we hadn't done the user stories, if we hadn't done the, the interviews, we would have been spending a significant sum of money to revamp a platform that would, not, would never be able to meet the needs in the, for the way they were described to us. So does that help you Robert? Yeah, absolutely. I mean that's, that's something that happens a lot in government. You successfully build software that no one wants. Uh, and I'm glad we headed it off in this case. Great. Well, let's go to our next topic. Um, let's talk about some of the challenges of Agile. Anyone can begin. Sure, some of the challenges of Agile. I, you know, I think that, um, at least in the, you know, um, at least kind of like in the federal realm that I've been in. I think Agile, um, at least so you like follow Scrum, it's, it's actually a pretty simple format and it's got pretty simple rules um, that anyone can, um, you know, kind of hit the ground running. I think, um, you know, uh, some of the challenges, you know, come into kind of staying true to the principles and values of Agile. Um, and I think like in the federal government, there's just, there's been, you know, just decades of habit of kind of doing things in such a waterfall way that, um, you know, e even as agencies begin to kind of go down this path, some of those, you know, some of those bad habits just, you know, seem to come out. So I think, you know, very much in the federal government, there's just a lot of kind of cultural and new habit development change that, that has to occur. And I think um, as more and more uh, projects are successfully using Agile, and those are highlighted, I think um, more, more and more agencies will get comfortable with that approach. Mm -hmm. The other piece that I would highlight is that it's hard to find people who have the skill sets. So to get somebody who's a product owner who has the ability to be to really understand the business needs and the and the user needs and be able to translate that into simple language that then can be built into the user story and given to a dev team. Um, somebody that requires a, a mix of skills that we haven't necessarily built up. And so when I'm looking to find product owners, it's pretty tough. I'm training most of them from the ground up. And taking, taking the, taking the um, people who I see as promising and then, and then giving them the skill set. It's not that I can, I haven't been able to sort of figure out how to bring in the right personnel to move this more rapidly. The, the other piece is also the cultural piece, so that goes into the hiring, but it also is even trying to explain um, an agile delivery schedule to, ex to my leadership um, took some time. And it, as, we be as we consistently delivered, they became more comfortable with it, but it took time to get there. Yeah. And there's a question from the audience that is related to, to some of the challenges. So, 
Um, do you have an example of how it gels well with compliance, legal, et cetera? Let's let Chris try to answer that question. How it gels well with compliance, legal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, well, I think it's not enough just to kind of have an agile-like product development process. Um, at least within the federal government, there needs to be some systemic agility. Um, you know, typically that the acquisition process in the in the federal government, um, you know, kind of often takes the uh, falls waterfall both in like form and function. So. Um, to kind of really work on that that side of the house and, and make sure that you're trying to um, shape those practices to be more in line with agile and even on the security side you know I think there, there are a set of practices that need to be put in place to um, get through what's typically like a really um, long um, authority to uh, um, operate approval process in the federal government so there's there's definitely all those sorts of different areas where it really required like you know get you got to unblock those different areas and get you know really kind of drive systemic agility across all the different processes and and compliance and regulations that 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 touch what you know um, the life cycle from you know kind of concept to deployment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I welcome uh, Rohit to try to refine his question based on the way we're answering because it, I'm not it's not obvious to me exactly where he or she would like us to focus this uh, answer. Um, I do believe if we take, for example, security as opposed to like 508 compliance, um, it may seem, and this touches on something that Laura started, that it's safer to have a well laid out schedule where you deal with security at the end of the process and you, you somehow feel confident that once you've done security and nothing's going to change, you're in a good position. But I actually believe most security experts would say it is much better to be dealing with security in an ongoing basis. Now, that requires a little bit of work on the development staff and the security staff to, for example, uh, run a scan every sprint or to find other technical ways to make sure that your 508 compliance and your cybersecurity stuff is being worked on the whole time that you're doing the work. However, it avoids the terrible risk that sometimes happens that you invest in a large project and spend a lot of money and you get to the end and you can't release it because it takes a long time to solve the security problem. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's actually a really good point. Um, yeah, you have so many different security controls, like at least in the federal government, that you have to test against that you know, at the end of every sprint, every two weeks, you know, you should be doing some rudimentary like scanning and fixing those issues right then and there so that you know, all along, you know, you're, you're going to have a somewhat compliant system and toward the end, you, you'll be there and it should expedite the, the approval process. So. I think that also if you want to think about how Agile gels outside of your development team, um, certainly the factor of, you know, keeping GC or your contracting officers in the loop more frequently uh, would help a lot, and especially if they can see that your your team is working on, say, two-week intervals, and how those two weeks roll up to months, those months roll up to quarters, those quarters roll up to annual program plans, and they're in the loop of that, then they have a better understanding of like, how your group works and in the Agile way. Yeah, so, um, you know, following up on that, I mean, there's two, two specific, I mean, you know, we talk about challenges, and then, so let's talk about how people are addressing them. And specifically, I'm curious, you know, Laura, you know, how are you getting people on board and training sort of the product owner set? And so, and I think you have a great example of how BBG is addressing the procurement issue, um, but just, you know, left to right, uh, I'd love to hear, you know, how you guys are addressing it from from those two things. Also, you know, I know at 18F you guys have 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 some things, and the White House is working on the tech bar. But um, can you guys sort of talk about how you're overcoming those challenges? So, well, in terms of the oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, in terms of the people and the product owners, it becomes very much. We're grow we're we're try we have um, one member of the team who's more experienced with agile, and then we're working through mentoring and training and identifying the right skill set. 
there is some there are some hiring authorities that allow us to bring in people who have more of the more of the product owner skill set, but it's also bringing somebody in um, cold almost into the government environment. They may have it's it's a tough transition. I, I'm sure Robert or Chris can speak more more closely to that since they came in about 18 months ago. But it's it also require it's not just having that product owner mindset it's also understanding how to be a product owner when you have to go through government acquisition when you have to be concerned about everything within the government culture and the government security um, and the IT culture for the government so it's that's the tough balance to be able to find I can find pieces of either one but it's the blending and that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of going down the path of growing my own yeah so I guess you think about the different and there, there are lots of challenges, and I'll, I'll just talk one specifically. So, I mean, if you think about the different layers of Agile, like, you know, program, project, and, like, a technical uh, iteration and, like, a technical practices layer, I, definitely one of the, the big challenges in that, that, that technical practices layer, and, and that's, where it's, um, that's where it's a challenge to get really talented technical folks inside government who know how to set up systems um, so that they can be developed and operated in an Agile way, you know, like, uh, setting up um, systems for um, automated deployments, continuous continuous integration, and, and automated testing. So there is definitely you know a challenge I think to kind of like jumpstarting agile within government because it's it's it is it's it's challenge for any company, um, whether Google or Apple, to get really great technical people in, and it's and it's a challenge for government as well. And I think to Laura's point, like a skills injection is is a big hurdle that the government has to overcome. So I would like to disagree a little bit slightly with that in the sense that um, I think, uh, well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean. Um, I think it's very important to think about professional development and growing your own people. Um, Agile is not very difficult, but to try to address um, John's question here, uh, you know, you don't need to hire Agile experts to solve problems. It's not that hard to become good at Agile but it does take a certain amount of time. Uh, in my experience at several um, non-governmental companies where I brought Agile into the fold, it usually took a year to 18 months. And in particular, um, the question, do you need your leadership to change in order to be successful? Um, yes, I think you do to be fully successful, but in both the cases that I did it in private companies, and to some extent what Chris and I are doing in the federal government and, and uh, other presidential innovation fellows like John Fellman who works with Laura Stanton um, is to simply show by example and lead by example and as, as Laura has perhaps witnessed almost any executive like Laura will immediately become a fan of Agile once they see that it actually mitigates the risk of failing projects and actually gives them more transparency and control into the project. And so just as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, at first executives often feel like they're losing control if they don't have a very crisp long-term plan with a big requirements uh, document. But if you can work, perhaps without permission, in an agile way until you can show results, that almost always uh, makes your leadership come on board uh, to the Agile bandwagon. Yeah, I just want to add that, um, like Robert said, uh, it's stuff, and also um, that Christopher mentioned was that um, you know you want to build a team first. So like for our office, what we did, which was I guess considered a big practice change, is that we stopped writing detailed statements of work, right? And so we looked for talent and people with experience and skills and we built the team in-house. And that was a big move for us. And so now we actually have a pretty good group of people who can take on projects as opposed to having the old way where we like would write a contract out that said that we're going to make something with you know these requirements and these specs. And we didn't you know, adhere to the requirements. Um, and changes came up, and things get screwed up. And I think the, the getting the people in is the most important part. And then with time, if they start practicing, you know, the, the Scrum two-week iteration way, then you get in that groove and then you can figure out, you know, your productivity of your teams and, and things start to work out. So 
yeah, I guess I'll get a little bit meta about the challenge here at the federal government. It, you know, if you looked at federal government IT spending, uh, you know, it spends like probably like eighty billion dollars a year, and I'm sure a significant portion of that money is going towards waterfall type um, acquisition of external services. So, um, you know, in the federal government, its um, procurements are really uh, governed by what's called the federal acquisition regulation. It just kind of lays out the rule of how you need to do um, procurements, sort of like a, a fair and impartial. Um, manner, and and again, I talked about you know just decades of habitually kind of doing things in the same way, and procurements very much follow you know waterfall and form and function. Just a lot of the myth busting that has to happen in the federal government that you act, the FAR is actually flexible enough to to procure services in an agile way. Like instead of having to write um, detailed um, um, technical specs that the contractor has to respond to, that you 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 can write solicitations in such a way where you're just buying cross-functional teams um, who specialize in Agile. So there's just a lot of that kind of um, education that has to occur that, you know, the federal acquisition regulation is flexible enough um, to do things in an Agile way. And Frank had a question regarding acquisition. So he says, curious if the panel thinks that the acquisition process is a significant barrier to widespread adoption of Agile in government? So I mean, just to follow up on what I just said, I, it 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 um, the only barrier is habit at this point, and that's where you know things like the tech far are going to help to kind of bust some of those 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 myths about what you can and can't do. Chris, do you would, want to elaborate on what the uh, tech far is for those who aren't? Yeah, oh yeah, with it? absolutely. So it, the tech far is a document that was written by the U.S. Digital Services within the Office of Management and Budget, and it specifically addresses the to topic of agile. And it is really addressed to procurement professionals who um, need to under, want to understand how that they can procure um, development services um, in an agile way, right? That you know they, they, they don't need to write, you know, uh, they don't need to spend two years writing upfront requirements um, as um, a prerequisite to going out and competing something in the marketplace. So again, it's like really addressed at the acquisition professionals to kind of um, do the myth busting and say yes. Here's here's ways that you can do agile within this federal acquisition regulation framework. And let me build a little bit on that as well. Um, you have I I we're, our agile development team is actually a contractor team um, with the government employees acting as product owners, and the contract is written in a fairly traditional manner. Um, and so we've still been able, we're still able to get there. It took some partnership with the contractor to be able to get to that point, but we were able to make it work within the existing framework. The, but it also is not just the acquisition. It's questions like, okay, at what point does an agile project or uh, an application or a system that's developed in agile move into operations and maintenance? It's the whole, st because traditionally once um, an authority to operate is signed off on, it transitions to a different model of work. Well, in the world that I'm working in, we got an AT, we got ATO'd um, nine months ago. We're still strong in development. And so it's really even figuring out organizationally how do we structure ourselves in order to fit a new development model. And those are the types of questions that we're still asking and we're still working through. Great. Um, another question from the audience from Henry Poole. Other than leading by example, has 18F or anyone else here discovered any unique ways to assist non-tech gov leaders in getting it quickly? Are there stories or workshops, I, workshop ideas that help the light go off for execs? You know, I'd like you know, to yeah, that. I was just going to say that, you know, Rob, you're a perfect one to answer this. Um, so one of the things that we use, and if you look at the HNF blog, you can find an example of this or Google proto sketching is um, we do run a lot of workshops. Um, and we have a variety of forms for that. Uh, one workshop is a very small three-hour simulation of an Agile Sprint or several Agile Sprints. I call it a three-sprint workshop. And my blog post has instructions for how anybody can do it. It takes a little bit of judgment, but it's not particularly difficult. I think if a beginner tried to do it, they would probably have trouble the first time they did it, but eventually would be able to figure it out. I think that can be used if you simplify the development 
and turn the development in either into a simple design task or even a writing task to help executives understand the power that Agile gives them to change course in the middle of the development, which I think most de develop, uh, executives really want uh, and need because requirements change. Um, the other thing that we sometimes do is we get a developer, a designer, and a customer in the room together into what we call a proto-sketching session. And we just try to build something as fast as we can. Now, it may sound ridiculous to try to build an application in three hours in a morning or an afternoon, but if you're willing to cut corners and sort of build a cardboard cutout or smoke and mirrors, you can make something that, that allows you to test with a real user if it's what a user wants. You normally cannot produce production-ready functionality in that space of time, but with modern JavaScript technology, um, the people who are in the know, the cool kids, if you will, um, can do this remarkably quickly. Um, so I, I believe the best way to convince people of this is to get a hands-on experience on a microscopic scale through some sort of workshop or coaching or experience. And I, I wonder if that is also an answer to another question that sounds similar from Pete Oliver Kruger, which is, what have you found to be the most effective results to show to change leadership's minds? Are, are there workshops like that? I would say uh, when they attend the sprint demos, that is a great way of demonstrating to leadership that you're getting things done. And especially if they, they don't have to attend all the demos, but you know, if they attend like the beginning, of say like your delivery cycle, the middle, and then the final, you know, before you're launching, and they see things progressively, incrementally improve, and and your and people are, t you know, the developing team is showing what they're working on, and and they're and they're taking in the feedback, and they're adapting, the, the, the um, what they deliver to what the users and and members of the stakeholder groups are are saying. Uh, our leaders, our leadership really loves seeing that happen, and and to see something, you know, a cycle time of like three months and you're delivering something that like everyone is happy with is, you know, it's pretty amazing to see in the government. Mm -hmm. And what about even before that, before you can convince an agile project to start? Are there certain things to show people in leadership that is very convincing, case studies or other things you all have been su successful with? I'm going back to the example that I used earlier about the um, about the customer interviews and using that using that is the foundation of how you're pre, how you're designing the entire agile project um, was very powerful for us because we we wanted to understand how people perceived us what the, what they found important what their pain points were and then we could develop a strategy um, that then relied I mean what we're doing is much bigger than the development but it was the whole strategy was built on that data and it's very difficult to argue when you get it from the users mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the things that we've used consistently to explain our decision making and our prioritization okay. so another question from our audience um, this is from Owen Barton. I'm wondering if agencies have tried blending internal and vendor development teams on an agile project and if and how it worked. Does anyone have experience with that here? Yeah, we, we do it all the time and um, the best way to do it is when they're co-located, like sitting next to each other, working side by side. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I like telework too, but I don't like it all the time. And I see more productivity when we actually have team members working beside each other physically. Yeah, we're faced with the, with the challenge at our building that we don't have enough space for the developer team. Um, so we have a very large developer team which is housed in a different part of the city. And so they, they're the ones who primarily do um, Sorry about that. They're the ones who are primarily doing the development, and we we see them occasionally. So that is that has been somewhat of a challenge. Yeah, and um, I'm to be able to do that. I work completely remotely with clients, and I I find that um, we do it pretty well. Like I I understand that Agile and Scrum specifically wants you to be co-located, but with technology and um, chat systems and Google Hangouts and things like that. We've worked um, with 
for example, City of LA, who have the internal um, department of engineers and designers, and we're all remote, and um, we we made it work. And of course, you make it, you take advantage of on sites, doing on site training and getting together in person when you can. Had um, once I had this uh, agile coach. He he gave some advice for if you do have offsite team that um, when you start a project, bring them in so they can get sort of acculturated, familiarized with other members, and also um, he said like six every six months, bring them back in together because that way you can you know you can get more um, equilibration I guess or it works better for team building. Mm -hmm. Having that person to person. Yeah. yeah, but you have to make a habit of like making that a regular thing, not like, okay, bye, and I'll never see you again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Budget in for travel time to bring the team in for like a week or two, and then they can go off in the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rob, Rob, um, Rob and Chris, how do you guys deal with that? Because I know ATNF is, ATNF is pretty decentralized, and there's people kind of all over the place. So how do you guys deal with that, um, you know, the remote and, and agile? Yeah, I, just, I mean, um, yeah, certainly we, there's all sorts of uh, tools we use to keep um, geographically dispersed teams, you know, kind of connected. Um, you know, if GitHub to Trello boards to, um, you know, video chats, um, we use, a, we use a, a messaging system called Slack, which is kind of like... Uh, a core part of like 18F's culture. So yeah, again, we, we use all sorts of um, tools to you know stay connected, um, and uh, you know still try to reap some of the benefits uh, that you would get from a co-located team just virtually. And what about on sites per Stone's comment? Um, how often do you guys bring? Yeah, I wouldn't say we're together? like very formulaic about it, but I mean, definitely we you know um, periodically is we, we try to get the teams all together. Um, there, there are, there are, there are some, um, particularly around like user experience type techniques, like a design studio that are really better facilitated in person. So if there's, if there's just a particular technique that we're going to use, um, that requires you know doing it in person, you know we'll, we'll, we will we'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I have actually done design studios over um, video chat, and you can do it um, if you have to. I'd like to um, talk a little bit about blending internal and um, vendor development. Um, we work with one agency, uh, a client right now, that's doing a very good job integrating those, and I think that's a really excellent idea. Um, one of the problems that you don't want to do is to have all of the people uh, on your inner team your government employees or, or your employees in one location and all of your contractors in another location. It would, it would almost be better to have them mixed even if the whole team cannot be in one place. And if you can, kind of have them sit contractor, employee, contractor, employee, contractor, employee to foster a team attitude and a shared responsibility. Um, when you mix vendors and contractors, it is, or when you mix contractors and employees, it's not uncommon for there to be some tension. Uh, and a good manager needs to try to um, remove that as much as possible. And the agile philosophy is that the team becomes completely responsible for the success, and the success is measured pretty much by customer feedback, not by checking against some contract document that was written at the beginning of the project. Um, so I believe it does require a little bit of management and attention to properly mix um, vendor and in-house development teams, but it can be done. Okay. okay. I don't know um, if there's any other questions, but I would love to um, hear you guys kind of address sort of the agile scenario. There's, you know, we've kind of been talking about the challenges, and we talked about the manifesto, but. What does it look like if I'm if I'm doing agile, starting from day one, um, you know, to week two? Can you guys kind of walk through, you know, what that experience is, so people kind of people who aren't familiar with it kind of understand the process? I can do that unless Laura would prefer to do it. Uh, okay, so <laughs> um, 
to me, the agile process begins with what are called user stories. And user stories are discrete pieces of functionality that are written with the user or the customer in the room. Because Agile is a very user or customer centered um, technique. And I love to lay them out on a table or lay them out on a whiteboard using uh, post-it notes. There are electronic means to do it, but it's hard to beat uh, three by five cards and post-it notes for this purpose because it really allows you to see what you're going to try to accomplish. Um, then normally you begin a sprint, um, often having estimated uh, either using story points, which I like, although I was uh, with an expert at USCIS uh, recently, he does not use story points, he just uses the number of stories um, as sort of an estimating technique. And you begin work, and it's very important that as soon as the developers finish something, they try to show it to the customer immediately. So at, at a minimum in your sprint, there's going to be a demo at the end where the customers really need to see what has been accomplished. But if you can, you show it to people sooner. And often that is produces some surprising results. Um, sometimes someone will say, yes, you have accomplished what I thought I wanted, but now I see that what I really want is something different. And you immediately write a new story and start working on that if the product owner so prioritizes it. So to me, agile development becomes more of an ongoing conversation than a deeply planned exercise. But the ceremony around Agile and Scrum methodology is designed to make sure that that um, uh, actually happens. Um, from a developer's point of view, you meet every day, you work on the stories, you meet the customer when the stories are done, or at a minimum at the, uh, at the demo or review at the end of the two-week sprint. And then you almost always make some adjustment in priorities. The more innovative and new the project is to you, the more changes to the stories and priorities you can expect. Um, if you're in a, a, a fairly well-established situation, there may not be that many changes in priority. Um, and then you simply repeat that sprint process uh, until you feel like you're done or until you need to change something. Um, and I'd like to kind of address the budgeting uh, question which was asked here. Um, the, the question from Neil Smith is, how does the budgeting mindset need to adjust? Um, typically, the budget for a project has to go through approval before the contract is let. That's absolutely true. That's the standard government way of doing things, and it's a little bit of a problem um, because inherent in that idea is this idea of doneness, that it's possible to say, when the software is done. But if, if we look at modern software, if we look at uh, Google or Chrome or uh, iOS from Apple or Apple apps that are on our phones or something like that, they're always changing. There, there's never a sense of being done. There is always just working on the next version. And so my um, advice to Mr. Smith would be to say, well, you contract enough to have confidence that you're going to be able to satisfy a lot of user needs. Not every user need. And then you trust that an Agile team will do a good job producing as many of those user needs as they can get to under your direction during that period of time. And you don't attempt to foresee every possible need. Let me build on that a little bit because we're dealing with the budgeting issue as well we have decided, and we'll see how successful this is, but we're going to try to frame it out in terms of the number of developers and the number of scrum teams and estimate sort of an amount of work that be, can be accomplished like that. Because we know what the price of a team is. And so we begin thinking about it in that sense. We begin thinking about the velocity that we want to move at. And then we can begin to say, this is a, an approximate scope of what you can accomplish. Um, with, within a, a set period of time with, with these resources. So that's the way that we're beginning to reframe it versus saying a project might be X amount of money. We're saying we want to be able to fund so many scrum teams and keep them all operational to respond to user needs as they develop. Um, I haven't tried that approach through our budget office yet, so 
I, I may I may come back and have to rethink it, but at least it's a, it's another way to think about it. That's what we're doing, and it's it's worked for our contracting office and also our CFO. So I'm I'm confident, Laura, that you will be successful with that as well. Uh, I want to add, um, as far as the day to day of running Agile, um, I really want to stress the importance of having the daily stand up. Uh, if, if there's any meeting that you need to have any sort of like overhead for a running an Agile project, I think the daily scrum is the most important. You know, you, you have to um, firstly limit it to like a, a very time box amount of time. 15 minutes or under is ideal. And the fact that you have to do it every day, again, I just want to stress. Um, I think that's a really good gauge of, of, of sensing where your, your team is, is heading within the two weeks that you're working on whatever you're trying to deliver. Um, so if even if like you have a team of one, please do a scrum every day. Are there any other terms or roles that anyone else wants to call it since this is Agile on Government 101 that we could talk about with the audience? Um, I can throw out some and you guys can describe them. Okay. So um, what's, you know, let's talk about uh, what a stand-up is. So a, a stand-up uh, was named, uh, I, I was introduced to it by Kent Beck, and the idea is that everyone's supposed to actually stand because human beings don't like to stand for that long, so it limits the time to 15 minutes. And that, that's why it's called a stand-up, although often people don't stand now in their stand-ups. Um, the idea is that it's a, a daily touch point where people can raise problems that people are having and offer solutions. The important thing for running a stand-up is to not let it become a discussion of the problem. What you do is you simply raise problems, agree that that's a problem, and you're going to talk about it after the stand-up, and then you create one-on-one -on -one meetings. And that's the way you can have a meeting with 10 or even 15 people, get it done in 15 minutes, and it generates a large number of side conversations which will have to be dealt with. Yeah. We've actually found that model to be so effective that not only do the scrum teams use it um, on a daily basis, but we also use it just for the program. Every, every day we have a 15-minute meeting and everybody sort of hits on the key issues and it, especially with a, with a team that's partially remote, it ensures that everyone, it keeps them looped in, ensure, ensures everyone knows what's going on, especially when you have a team that, I mean, unfortunately, that spends most of their day in meetings. Um, and doesn't have much other time to communicate everybody and it's we do it at 8:30 a.m. which sort of is tough on the fact we have a we have one person on the west coast and he calls in at 5:30 a.m. every morning for us but that's been a huge factor in keeping our team connected to one another that's, that's torture dedication. yeah that's torture <laughs> he, I asked if he wanted us to change it and he said no so um, i only feel mildly guilty as a result <laughs> Yeah, let's let's make sure that uh, it, it is known that he is an anomaly um, for, us, for us West Coasters. But yeah, that's I mean, Laura, that's great that you mentioned that. I think that we it's funny that we use stand up in so many other areas now. Like any 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 anything that you're trying to work on that requires a high degree of collaboration, stand up is such a it's a great tool to do that. Yeah, and I know I mean this is somewhat related, but you know we keep hearing this word scrum. Um, can you guys sort of explain what that is for people who are c really confused by that? Um, well, the Wikipedia article on it is very good. Um, the Wikipedia article says that it was a Japanese technique invented in the 80s, but I never heard about it until um, the famous extreme programming backlash. So what happened uh, in the history of this is that the Agile Manifesto was created about 19... 99, I think, um, or 2000, and Kent Beck came out with the book Extreme Programming Explained. And extreme programming is a way of doing agile development, which is true to the principles of the agile manifesto, but is a little different than the scrum methodology. And unfortunately, although I love and perhaps prefer extreme programming, um, there was a bit of a backlash against it, and then people brought up scrum as an alternative methodology. So when we talk about stand-up meetings, sprint demos, and that kind of ceremony around the Agile process, 
Scrum is more or less the most popular of several different ways of handling that uh, particular way of organizing a team. Mm -hmm. And I like to describe it as a roadmap. So if you're new to Agile and you need some guidelines to get started, just following Scrum, it's it's laid out for you. You just follow it, and it's very simple. Although it's difficult to break habits and actually do Scrum, it's a very simple roadmap. And what about Kanban? I know nothing about Kanban. I've never used. Yeah, it. I can't say I'm an expert on this one, but I'll give it a I'll give it a crack. I think it kind of comes out of like the the manufacturing world about really kind of like looking at the constraints in your in your production processes and um, the way that you, you know you can only get so much you know you're only going to get through much um, output based on you know what's your like you know biggest constraint so I th it's really kind of a way of like looking at the flow of work going through a process and then trying to limit the work and process because like the more work and process that you have on um, the more highly utilized something is, then the less available time you like actually have to work on other things. So you want to keep the work and process to a limit and get that done and flowing through the system and then move on to the next thing. So that, that's about as best a definition I can give. That's a pretty clear definition. Um, it's it's primarily you. I wouldn't. I I don't think of it in terms of agile. I think of it in terms of either manufacturing or paperwork. For example, when you're so backed up and the thing sits on your on your desk for five, for a week or two because you just can't get to it to read it, that's that's an example of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's more Lean Six Sigma than it is uh, than I would think of it in the agile world. Yeah. I mean, I've I've heard it used. Uh, I think yeah, a lot of agilists would say it's kind of a you know a technique that falls under the umbrella. Um, I, I think I, I've heard a lot of companies talk about using Kanban as sort of a gateway to Agile that at least starts getting you know, familiar with some of the practices. Um, but again, yeah, I'm, I'm not a total expert in it. There, there's a lot more literature coming out on it. Um, I, I see a lot of startups um, have blogging about their switch from Agile to Kanban and, and the reasons for doing so. It's you know much more focused on continuous delivery and then you know trying to like really kind of attack the constraints in your process to get more throughput. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know we have a lot of questions, um, but uh, and I'll stop asking. Um, I'll stop doing the word quiz. Um, well, this is related. This one's related. But uh, just on that note, if you know, I we have we do have sort of a list of terms and roles on the uh, in the handbook. Um, you can take a look there. Mm -hmm. So I think we probably have time for one more question from our audience, and this is coming from Pete Oliver Kruger. So he says, speaking of Laura's customer research, how far are we from introducing lean enterprise ideas like customer development in the Agile process, helping agencies um, earlier to define its requirements based on citizen demand versus internal agency priorities? So anyone here have experience with Lean? And uh, based on the question, it sounds maybe talking a little bit more about user-centered design, right? Mm -hmm. So it's funny, our, our executive director here at 18F likes to talk about stakeholder design versus user-centered design. And that, especially when you're dealing with a, like a service that's very citizen-centric, you know, you really need to design um, with users' needs in mind first. Um, in reality, you know, you, you do have to kind of have a balance between stakeholders and users because stakeholders are the kind of the, the ones obviously funding the project. So I'm sure they have return on investment expectations and things like that. But I I, I think we're seeing a lot of progress um, in that area. Like in the federal government, um, there's there's a, more and more emphasis on hey, you know, we really need to be thinking about users first when we're we're designing. Um, and Rob talked about user stories. It's such a great way of sort of bridging the gap. It's really great. It's really more or less like a, a good communication tool between um, uh, customers, uh, users, stakeholders, and and developers. So, mm -hmm. so I, I am not familiar with Lean Enterprise, but I, I know a little bit about Lean Startup, um, and I consider it a little bit of a refinement on um, the Agile technique because Agile, as it has traditionally been practiced, has always been a learning methodology where you're constantly getting feedback from the customer. Um, if I understand Lean Startup correctly, one of the things you do is you write down the hypothesis that you're trying to test in every iteration. Um, 
I think that's a very valuable idea, um, particularly when you really need, when you're not sure what you want to build. Um, in some ways, it's very aligned with um, agile development in general. And like Kanban, it's a little bit of a refinement rather than a different technique. Mm -hmm. Yep, and most MVPs talked a lot about with that of get, getting the most valuable product out there first, um, getting user feedback, and potentially even then getting additional funding. Well, I bet Laura can speak to the MVP concept. Yeah, that's that's been how we've modeled everything that we've done, has been through explicitly saying, look, at this is the MVP, and if we find it valuable, we'll continue, and if not, we'll stop now. And um, we've continued that refinement to say uh, the problem, we, we've run into a challenge that um, they want the NVP scaled across a number of different things. Um, so we're, we took, where perhaps if we were focused on one just IT acquisition, we could, fo we could move very rapidly into deeper and deeper iterations. Um, but instead, we're we're focus we're rebuilding the same MVP. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a little it it slows the getting into the greater number of features issue. But that's been exactly how we framed it as we've briefed it to executives, we've briefed it to stakeholders. Is this is the MVP, and we can adjust it very rapidly from here. And that's proven to be a very successful way to communicate it because nobody feels that they're stuck with whatever you show them if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's that been a great selling point. Great. And we're about at the end of our time box, so I think we should end here. There's a couple questions that we did not answer, um, and I would encourage Rohit and Frank to post those in the LinkedIn EGL group. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for participating and our audience and those who ask questions, and we will do another AGL Live next month. So we hope to see you all there. And we'll post this video on the Agile Gov Leaders um, website so you can find it there if you want to share it as well. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.